I'm Laura Samos, the Executive Director of the Naki S. Loeb School of Communications, and welcome to Sunshine Week. For those of you who are new to our school, we are a 20-year-old nonprofit. We were established with a mission to promote and defend the First Amendment and to foster interest, integrity, and excellence in journalism and other forms of communication by educating students of various ages and providing them with the tools and the knowledge to improve their skills. You are part of this mission by attending events and classes with us, so thank you. And you can learn more about our work at our website, loebschool.org. That's L-O-E-B school.org. In a moment, I'm going to hand things over to our moderator, but first I want to thank our co-host for this webinar, the New England First Amendment Coalition, or NEFAC. NEFAC has great programs this week for Sunshine Week and all year round. You can learn more at their website, nefac.org, that's N-E-F-A-C.org. So welcome to all of you who are here with us and welcome to our panelists. Thank you for your time and expertise. Casey, why don't you take it away? Thanks so much, Laura. And thank you to everyone who's attending tonight. It's always encouraging to me as a member of the press to see others take an interest in the public's right to know. And um, I think that we all have a role to play in upholding that. So I appreciate you being here. Um, I'm gonna start it off with a question to all of our panelists um, and I'll, I'll kind of go around because I know it can be kind of challenging to weigh in when we're all in separate rooms. But um, the kind of overarching question that I would love to hear everyone's thoughts on to kick us off tonight is, um, you know, what has been the most significant development in the last year, either positive or negative or somewhere in between um, for government transparency in New Hampshire? And I'll start off with Attorney Sullivan to, to you for that question, if that's okay. Sure. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, well, 2020 was, to me, a real terrific year for the public's right to know in New Hampshire. There were four cases that went before the Supreme Court, uh, union leader and ACLU uh, versus the town of Salem, uh, Seacoast newspapers versus the city of Portsmouth, uh, Marianne Salchetti versus the city of Keene, and uh, ACLU of New Hampshire and Union Leader and five other uh, press organizations uh, suing the Department of Justice to get the release of what most people in the public call the Lawry's List, although it's now the uh, EES schedule. Um, so in May, the Supreme Court, uh, to make it short, overruled the case of Union Leader versus Fenneman, which was a horribly decided case in my opinion, because I lost the case before the Supreme Court in 1993. Uh, and it took all these years uh, for a new Supreme Court to overrule that decision. And I will thank Attorney Bissonnette, who was my co-counsel in two of those four cases. Um, and his, his work was tireless and, and we were rewarded as a result. And um, with that, I'll go ahead and segue to Attorney Bissonnette if you want to pick up with, with your thoughts on that topic. Thank you. Thanks, Casey. Thank you, Greg. Thanks, everyone. Um, I think, uh, you know, Greg is right. It, um, the, the work that we put in trying to overturn the Fenneman decision was really years in the making. We uh, took a lot of uh, care uh, in selecting uh, what we thought was an appropriate case to challenge that rule and just uh, that... The, the case that we worked on in particular had to do with an internal audit that was compiled by a, an independent uh, uh, company that evaluated the practices of um, the Salem Police Department and concluded that in particular, their internal affairs investigation practices were really not up to snuff. They weren't doing things uh, the right way. They weren't, they weren't uh, comporting with best practices. And the report was, was pretty damning. There were portions of that report that were redacted um, that, that we thought really the public uh, should have a right to know, but those redactions really uh, bumped right up against what the prevailing law was at the time, which is if you have documents related in any way to personnel information of uh, public employees, in this case, police officers, 
that that information would not see the light of day, period, full stop, even if the privacy interests were minimal because you're dealing with official public acts, and even if the public interest was really high, right, where there may be allegations of potential wrongdoing. So, you know, this is kind of what, what impact litigators do, right? You, you find a compelling set of, of, of facts and then try to build a case around it. And that's really, uh, you know, uh, what, what Greg and I tried to do when we put, you know, our best foot forward to try to really paint a picture for the Supreme Court as to why this rule is wrong, right? Here are the really bad ramifications that could, could come about when this type of material, which is so obviously important, still wouldn't see the light of day. And let me just say that this really, this, this problem didn't just arise in the context of um, issues concerning law enforcement. We litigated a case around the same time dealing with the Concord School District. There was a report compiled um, detailing how the school district there, uh, you, you know, perhaps inadequately investigated allegations of a teacher who engaged in sexual abuse, right? Um, the public was clamoring for this report. Um, you know, people wanted to know what did the district know and when did they know it? And they couldn't get access to it. And the position of the, of the school district was, nope, that's personnel related. Even if there's a public interest in disclosure, even if there's a minimal privacy interest, the public doesn't gain access to it. And in fact, while we were litigating, Greg and I, the Salem case, we flagged that for the court, in fact, and tried to make clear that this is, goes far beyond Salem. This goes far beyond police. And this is really, I think, the hallmark exhibits of just how the, the Fenneman rule really went, went, went astray. We kind of veered off course. And I, I should note that other states, plenty of other states, did not have the Fenneman rule, right? They had a similar type of balancing test in interpreting their analogous public records law. So, you know, I think Greg's right. We, um, you know, we're very pleased with the ruling. We think it's the right ruling. And, you know, now we're in a, we're in a, a period of time where I think everyone understandably is trying to figure out what does this balancing test mean, right? <laughs> and, you know, we're all struggling with it, advocates, municipal lawyers, judges, and I can tell you that, you know, one of the things that Greg and I are thinking about now, because this is our job, it's the, one of the fun parts of the job, is how do we build cases now to present to the courts, you know, uh, a compelling case for why the balancing test should be construed in our favor. And really, I think our argument that we're making in multiple cases now before superior court judges um, is, hey, listen, you know, if you're dealing with official acts, you know, then there's a public interest in disclosure, there's minimal privacy interest, and that is how we should balance this. And in those types of cases, the information should be released. And there's been most of the cases, there's only been a few have reached that conclusion, but we'll see, you know, the Supreme Court is going to be the last word and we'll see in the next couple of years, you know, what the Supreme Court has to say about it. Great, thank you. And I guess over to um, Attorney Rice, um, I know that you have a background as a lawyer representing media organizations having represented WMUR in the past, but these days you often find yourself, I think on the other side of requests from um, you know, Attorney Sullivan, Attorney Bissonette and others. Um, what's been the impact of the last year um, from, from your view on the public's right to know? Well, um, thankfully the city of Manchester has not been on the receiving end of any litigation by either Attorney Sullivan or Attorney Bissonette. Uh, and, uh, but I think that, I mean, they are, they are absolutely right that the, um, uh, the repeal of the Fenneman case is very, very um, significant. I haven't had the opportunity to respond to a record request um, in, that, in that era after now the court in the town of Salem case has issued a decision on remand. Um, but my, my understanding of the law as it stands now is that, um, Yes, there is a balancing test, but as you know, uh, the preamble um, to the right to know law and also much of what was said in both um, decisions by the New Hampshire Supreme Court make it very clear uh, that the public interest is uh, the um, primary and predominant consideration uh, in, in these cases. Um, but in terms of your initial question, uh, Casey, what I would say is I, th I think that um, uh, COVID-19 and the way that it has uh, forced a migration to uh, accessible and one might argue um, even more public platforms 
I think it's the biggest change um, that I've seen vis-a-vis -vis, um, the public's access to government proceedings. I think that everybody here has uh, participated in or seen some of the legislative hearings in Concord that have been attended by hundreds and hundreds of, of people. Um, I know that um, you know, elected officials um, have uh, you know, various viewpoints about this. Um, and I, I, I do understand uh, the, um, uh, the desire um, to be in person and to have that kind of face-to-face -face interaction. Um, I personally don't believe that there's really any substitute for that. But I hope that um, we will not lose um, sight of the both and uh, option. Um, perhaps um, we can leave the uh, COVID-19 pandemic crisis with um, you know, public bodies that are able to um, you know, meet face-to-face -face, uh, you know, fully um, with everyone who wishes to participate, but at the same time, um, give access to those committee proceedings um, you know, remotely. Uh, because there are many, many people who prior to this time um, were unable to, um, to participate. And just giving my friend um, Judge Delker um, a segue, I would see that another positive benefit that we've seen is, um, is, has to do with court proceedings, um, both for um, the public and for, um, and for defendants and litigants themselves. So for example, um, our office uh, works primarily in the district division of the Ninth Circuit Court um, here in Manchester. And um, yes, there are challenges um, presented by, um, by the remote proceedings. We don't currently have a widespread video option um, in our court. And I hope that maybe someday that will, that will come. But there are many people who used to have to um, take a whole day off, perhaps without pay, in order to participate in their own proceedings. Um, and now they're able to do that um, you know, while they're at work or in their car at lunchtime. Um, and I think that there's a, a certain amount of openness um, toward the, um, the ju judicial branch uh, that um, the public is also benefiting from, perhaps without even uh, without even knowing it. So I, I, I would say I would say the the remote participation option for the public has been the biggest change um, over the last year. Um, and then Judge Delker, I'd love to love to hear your thoughts on that as well. Yeah, I was gonna. I'm, I'm glad uh, Emily. Uh, raise that that point because that is also um, what I see as probably the biggest development over the last 12 months in terms of public access. Um, the COVID pandemic has really both created challenges as well as opportunities um, in this area in terms of openness of courts. You know, in um, be, as a result of the necessity of the emergency orders and and the health risks, courts have physically closed to the public. And so what we had to struggle with was how to continue to administer justice, to make sure that those proceedings were open to the public in some way, because that is a cornerstone of the New Hampshire constitution and of our um, democratic system of government is that people can see what we're doing and that it be accessible. And you know that's why we're all here tonight because of that principle. Um, and to do that uh, in, a, in a world, in a, in a court world where we were all um, operating with the physical presence of everyone being there was very challenging. And so I have to give it to the administrative office and, and, and the folks you know, that um, sort of run the technical side of things. Uh, for the Superior Court, they ramped up very quickly to provide us uh, with access to virtual, the, the technology to do virtual hearings. Um, I actually was just, Emily, to your point about um, uh, bringing this to circuit court, you know, more video hearings, because I know primarily they're doing telephonic hearings in circuit court. I was actually just talking to uh, Dan Morin, who is the technical person in charge of rolling this out the other day, and, and we're piloting the software in my courtroom right now that's going to be used in circuit court, and I think circuit court's the next, after we work out the kinks over the next couple of weeks in my courtroom, it'll be rolling out in the circuit courts, um, because they've, they've sort of um, gotten some affordable technology to make that option available in the circuit courts. But I think, so in, in some ways, um, it's been a, a mixed blessing. Uh, I think the greatest challenge has been uh, to conduct jury trials um, during this time where those are still being done in with physical presence. Um, 
we have juries socially distanced, the lawyers socially distanced, and as a result of that, we have to limit the number of people who can physically be in the court. And uh, I did one trial in the fall, and, and I'm uh, scheduled to start another trial, jury trial this week. Um, the one I did in the fall, I had to, because we were really in sort of the heart of the pandemic at that point, uh, there were only four public seats physically present in the courtroom. So we reserved one for the media, one for the um, victim's family, one for the defendant's family, and then one for the general public. But then what we did was we, we, we um, made available by, um, well, the first trial I did, we made it available by closed circuit TV. So we had a camera and video screen in the courtroom that then projected the entire proceedings into another courtroom where we had set up available seating for any member of the public who wanted to watch those proceedings. Um, and um, so, and, and that was the way we were able to provide access in a safe and socially distanced environment. I know some courts actually used uh, live stream over the internet. Uh, there was, the case I did was a domestic violence case and there's some legal concerns about broadcasting those kind of cases under the Violence Against Women's Act, federal federal law, about viol uh, broadcasting those cases over the internet. So that's why we opted for the closed circuit uh, option. But nonetheless, you know, we we worked um, tirelessly to make sure that we had access to the public, to anyone who wanted to watch what we were doing in the court. And and I think I think it went fairly well. I mean, we did have people come in and and watch proceedings, and um, you know, seemed to go smoothly. So. I think we'll definitely spend a lot of time picking up on on both of those points, especially just, you know, as a member of the media, um, there have been both benefits and challenges to this remote access, but I'll say that it's it's much easier, especially if I'm jumping between legislative hearings or court hearings to, to do so from my computer than um, trying to physically travel to different buildings across the state. Um, just jumping back to um, what attorneys Sullivan and Bissonette um, started discussing um, to, to focus a little bit more in on the implication of those um, Supreme Court rulings this year. Um, and I'll turn this to either of either of you. Um, what practically um, does the Lori list or the, um, the EES ruling mean for the public's ability to assess the trustworthiness of law enforcement in New Hampshire? Sure. I mean, that that is an important case, just like the town of Salem and the Seacoast newspapers case was incredibly important. So in the, the Lori list or EES case, the court concluded that the EES list was not an internal personnel practice document and was also not a personnel document. And the reason for that was because the list is not used for a personnel purpose, right? It's used for this independent function and independent obligation that prosecutors have to be able to um, track and ascertain whether they're complying with their obligations to produce exculpatory evidence. In this case, uh, information uh, in an officer's personnel file that may relate to credibility or trustworthiness that needs to be disclosed. And so ultimately the court concluded that no, those exemptions you know, don't, don't apply. Um, because it's not a personal document, but the court, what the court did was say the Superior Court didn't really address uh, a different exemption, the kind of uh, catch-all invasion of privacy exemption, which deals with the very balancing test that we're talking about, and sent it back to the Superior Court for balancing. And that case is still now, is now pending before a Superior Court, and, you know, we'll see what happens there. There's, there's some discussions going on right now that are not yet concluded to see if there could be possible resolution there. Um, and, and the parties are still working um, on that. But a very important case, and, and you know, it, it, I think it's emblematic of just where we are right now, which is the lower courts are trying to now figure out how to apply this balancing test. And municipal lawyers and advocates like us are trying to do it too. And, and there's also other constituencies, right? You have police unions, you have advocates for public employees that also maybe have a different view of how balancing should be applied. So all of those arguments are kind of percolating right now and we'll just, we'll have to see where, where the courts uh, end up. There is one case I should say that is before the state Supreme Court right now called uh, the Provenza case. Um, there it's a case out of, oh gosh, I'm forgetting. I think it's a, a Canaan, um, 
uh, dealing with a Canaan police officer who is now actually a state trooper. There was an allegation made that that officer engaged in excessive force, an investigation was conducted, um, and that case implicates the, the, that report and whether it should be made public. There, interestingly enough, there was a finding made by the evaluator that the misconduct was uh, not sustained. Um, and so the, there, there's going to be a question before the Supreme Court, should that matter? Should that, how does that play into the balancing analysis? The position that the ACLU and Attorney Sullivan are taking there is that, well, sustained or not, the public should have a window into the process um, because there's no, you know, no way for the public to know what the process was, whether it's a credible finding or not without evaluating the investigation itself. Whether that argument will prevail or not, I don't know. And, you know, we'll have to see in, in six months or a year's time. Of course it will. <laughs> I'll let and you pick up on that, Attorney Sullivan. I want, to back that up. I want to back up just a little bit. And for those who don't know what this balancing test is, there's, there's three elements to it. The first question that the courts are supposed to ask is, is there a privacy interest? Secondly, does the public have an interest in disclosure of the information? And then third, uh, they balance the public's interest versus any privacy interest. Now in the Salcetti case, uh, the court has ruled that a privacy interest of a police officer in the performance of his duty is nominal, is what the court said. Now I disagree with that. I, I wouldn't use the word nominal, I would say non-existent. Um, and of course these cases are determined on a case by case basis. But in that case, the court said, the court cannot discern any privacy interest vested in an officer. And that relates to the performance of his or her public duties. How can they have a privacy interest? And the second point I wanna make, which Jill sort of alluded to, it's not just the individual employee that we wanna look at, it's the supervisory personnel to determine whether they took appropriate action. If they say not sustained, but we have information that it should have been, then at least the public has the right to, to voice their concerns. Um, going on, um, on the kind of the flip side of things, looking in court and thinking about how um, the Lori list um, uh, has, has had an effect on how court proceedings um, operate. Um, I would be curious to hear maybe from, from Judge Delker, um, to what extent did the Lori list or um, the EES um, as, it, as it now exists um, create any kind of complications in the courtroom in terms of, do you recall ever seeing instances where, um, you know, concerns about disclosure of information that's on the list has, has had any kind of interfering effect on, you know, what otherwise would be a pretty routine case um, before your, your court? Sure. So the way these issues um, have been addressed historically, and I'm, I'm curious to see how this will play out in the aftermath of the Lori, uh, the EES case, um, is that the court would review the police files in camera, which is um, so, uh, sort of legal, Latinese, legalese for um, taking the file in chambers, not having anyone else you know, involved in the case, um, review the file and the judge would look through it much like a judge does with uh, records that are otherwise privileged such as uh, medical records, counseling records, um, you know, those sort of things that, that have a statutory privilege. Um, and so the um, court would have to evaluate those records and decide is there information in these records that um, might impact the credibility of the police officer or otherwise be relevant to the defense in the case. And so if there is, that information gets turned over to the parties and then they um, typically have to ask permission before they can use that information uh, publicly during the course of the trial. Um, so um, it's a tiered approach to the disclosure. And, and, and we really treated these records the same as we did, as I said, um, you know, other privileged records. And, and I'm curious to see whether that continues to be the case post EES list. Now there is a different, I mean, you know, one of the interesting pieces about that 
decision is the EES decision was focused just on the list of officers. And the only information in there was the name of the officer, the town, uh, you know, whether there was a finding and what, you know, sort of what the nature generally of the um, misconduct was. What we're as what we as judges are looking at is the entire personnel file. And in those cases, there's no question that that is a personnel file. It's coming from the police station. It not only includes the officers, you know, issues of potential misconduct, but it includes commendations and, you know, was the officer late for work or were there other issues going on? Um, and, and, and some of that is going to be private and some of it isn't. And, you know, how that all plays out, I think, will be interesting in the aftermath of the EOC case, uh, EES case, rather. Um, Attorney Rice, um, understanding that you may not be able to get into the specifics of any, <laughs> any one request or any one file, um, but I, I was struck by listening back to some of the arguments in um, this case before the Supreme Court over, over this past weekend. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there were some questions or concerns that were raised, um, you know, perhaps in some sense, um, just kind of to, to ask the attorneys before the court to explore these, but of, um, you know, of that point that Judge Delker just raised, that there's a limited amount of information that is in this particular document. How often do you find yourself kind of on the receiving end of requests that would be, um, you know, if provided just um, on their own, lacking appropriate context? And what um, steps do you or other your other kind of colleagues at the city level take to fill in that context in, in you know, in the event that, that you're concerned that it's lacking in a particular document? So um, first, I just wanted to point out that um, the exercise that um, Judge Delker was talking about vis-a-vis -vis taking a look at the entire personnel file, that's by virtue of a different statute, um, RSA 10513B. So sometimes there's a nexus between those issues um, and 91A issues, um, and both of those have formulated um, the basis of some of the arguments made on behalf of the state by the uh, Attorney General's office in these various cases. Vis-a-vis -vis, um, requests for um, internal investigation reports, um, information in officer personnel files, and some of the other material that we're talking about, as Gilles um, alluded to, there are many stakeholders involved in these, um, in these requests. So um, uh, the, the, the hometown newspaper here in Manchester uh, is very active um, through their uh, reporters in in making uh, those kinds of requests, at, as is um, the ACLU and some other um, organizations. Um, and so um, when these things uh, occur, um, sometimes, sometimes the, it's simply a request for information. Sometimes as both um, Gio and Greg mentioned, it's because um, they wish to um, advance um, a change in the, in the law and are going to um, utilize some of these requests and the response of the public officials to these requests in order to um, in order to try and and bring about um, bring about change. Um, I, I would say that because the law um, in New Hampshire has been um, developing very rapidly, um, as Greg mentioned, um, over the past year, um, you know we we have to do our very very best to keep up with it in order to apply the legally required um, tests. But as an example, um, I'll offer that um, the town of Salem case was decided at the end of, of May um, 2020, and then subsequently it was remanded to the trial court. And I believe that decision just came out probably within the last two months or so. So um, that sort of put a little bit more, um, a little bit more uh, meat on the bones. And also, um, as you uh, referenced, um, well, I actually, I think the, uh, the Provenza case um, that, was, that was just discussed, that's kind of an interesting case because it was the officer um, himself uh, who uh, brought the lawsuit um, trying to um, curtail access to what he argued were, uh, were his, his personnel records. So there are many, many players beyond um, the requester and the, and the, and the, the municipality or other, other government entity. Um, so I, I would just say that when a request like that comes in, I mean, there's a very painstaking analysis because um, as a government entity, you can't simply write back and say, no, you, you don't get any, any of this file. You have to explain your reasoning and you have to be able to, if you're challenged in court, you essentially have to be able to articulate that, that reasoning. Again, assuming that the balancing test applies with respect to every, every 
sentence, every piece of paper um, that is in that that is in that file or in that quantum of documents that's been requested. Um, so um, it's a very labor intensive and detail oriented uh, process. Um, as a practical matter, um, it's a, an interactive process um, because we do try to have conversations with um, you know with the requester um, any legal counsel that may be representing anybody whose um, personnel record um, is, is at issue, uh, you know, et, et, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, Greg alluded to something that I just wanted to, um, to sort of underscore, which is that, um, you know, you reach the balancing test if there is a, um, a you know, a, a private interest and then also a public interest. And I think that um, Greg often argues on behalf of his clients that the um, private interest is either minimal or non-existent. And if he's able to successfully argue that, then there isn't anything to balance. I think that that's where he, um, you know, where he has, has argued um, successfully in some cases. Um, and that forms uh, also the basis of a, uh, another pending case regarding police standards and training uh, records. So, um, so I would say it's, it's, uh, it, it's very interesting, but also, also can be very, um, very time consuming and the negotiation can be very complex. Casey, can I can I chime in on that? I, I just want to say, I mean, I know that, uh, you know, Attorney Rice and I have worked on the opposite ends of requests where I've made them and she's responded. And I, I can just say that Manchester is among the best in the state, you know, that they're truly looking at these requests with uh, with a presumption in favor of transparency, which is really what Chapter 91A is about. If all things kind of appear equal, the, the law tips the balance in favor of transparency and that's the mindset behind the law and just working you know with manchester is a real pleasure um you know because i know the public officials there um, really take that um, seriously but the one thing i just wanted to flag too that i think the next there's going to be another slew of cases going forward on the statute that um, Emily mentioned RSA 10513B and what that means. That is going to be a really important set of cases going forward because, you know, right now our position is that balancing applies to all these documents, whether they're documents related to the police or other public employees. The law enforcement uses RSA 10513B to actually claim that they have special protections that balancing doesn't apply to their files. And in fact, they have that that statute still categorically exempts their personnel files from production. And we don't think that's the case. And the EES decision decided not to address that, but I can tell you that is coming down the pipeline inevitably. <laughs> I, I just, I, I, that, that is going to be coming up in the future, may even come up in the Preventa case. And the other point that I just wanted to make uh, piggybacking off what, what Emily said is, um, there are third party interests here, obviously, employees have third party interests. Um, and so what we're starting to see as well is those employees bring cases arguing exemptions under the public records law. And it's in the FOIA context, it's called a, re a reverse FOIA lawsuit. And now because of this balancing test, we're starting to see that, and we may start having a body of law develop here in New Hampshire that is, I don't want to get too in the weeds, but it's kind of like the reverse FOIA law that's developed at the federal level. So we'll just have to see how all those play out. Because in the Preventa case, it is a, a police officer who filed the lawsuit asking for an injunction barring the municipality from producing the records, which is not usually how we envision public records litigation. I, I, I didn't mean to get sidetracked, but I just, Emily brought up some great points, so. And, and, and there was a pre-existing case out of Hillsborough County where a police officer um, successfully argued that his name should be removed from the EES Lori list um, because there wasn't a sustained finding uh, related to credibility. And, and, and so, <clears throat> you know, this isn't a unique uh, area that it's been a fruitful area of litigation for quite some time. Um, I, I want to follow up on um, Attorney Bissonnette, what you were alluding to in terms of kind of evolving, evolving law, evolving policy. I think you sit at kind of the intersection of the courts, policy making, um, and then also kind of being, you know, involved in making requests. Um, how have kind of the ongoing conversations and activism around police accountability in, you know, that have been ongoing for a while, but have really 
you know, grown, um, grown more um, robust in the last year. Um, how's that impacted policy debates around what kind of information the public should be able to access about police and, and similar agencies? Yeah, it's impacting policy debates right now um, at the legislature. Um, the, the overruling of the Fenneman decision back in May, that, that actually occurred four days after um, the killing of George Floyd. So it happened, that decision kind of happened right in this moment, right, where we were, I think, all collectively kind of wondering, like, how could we be better as a society? How could we do better as a society? Not just respect with policing, but increased transparency around policing. And so that kind of carried over into the Governor's Lee Act Commission, right, where a group of stakeholders got together to try to map out um, some potential reforms. Um, it percolated now into the subsequent Superior Court cases that we're talking about that now apply this balancing test for the most part in favor of transparency. Now there's been a little bit, I should say, at the legislature of an effort by some to roll back our, our win in the courts. Um, SB 39 was proposed to basically make many of these records exempt, kind of go back to the old days. And I think we've, Greg and I have been arguing forcefully why that is not what we should be doing. If anything, we should actually be more transparent. You know, maybe if we're, if we're legislating this balancing test, maybe we should be legislating that things should be categorically public, right? As opposed to categorically private. But we're, we're starting to see a lot of these debates that, you know, were triggered by what happened over the summer, both with some police issues and, and with our, our court, uh, our court wins. Um, I'd be um, curious to hear too, just kind of stepping back to um, some of the conversations that were playing out during the oral arguments and in these other cases that we were talking about. Um, Attorney Sullivan, I know you were involved in the, um, the Keene State case and, and some of the questions that came up there um, had to do with to what extent is the public entitled to access data versus um, you know any other distinction that you want to draw between how information is kept. Um, and I wonder how you think that the, the conversation in that case and the ruling in that case um, may have an impact on the public's ability to access um, information that lives in a database um, versus any other kind of, of record um, that they may seek. Yeah, I, I didn't see that as a, as a significant issue in that case because I think the law has been well established that whatever form, electronic or otherwise, that information is kept, the public has a right to see it unless it falls under one of the exemptions in 91A. But, but the Keene case, uh, five students, and we're going to talk about this Thursday evening again in a webinar, um, but they were looking for different kinds of records, each, each of the five, uh, restaurant inspection records, for example, police use of excessive force, different kinds of uh, crimes that had occurred, and they were just shut down categorically. And, and the, the city said, we don't have the list that you're looking for. And I looked at their requests and they weren't requesting lists. It was just, to me, something that the city thought was a convenient argument to make, which uh, tragically was upheld in the Superior Court. And that was prior to my involvement in the case. I, I got involved when the case was on its way to the Supreme Court. Um, but, you know, a lot of credit to Professor Salcetti and her five students because they didn't take no for an answer. She filed a case pro se in the Superior Court she got a lot of help from an organization called Right to Know New Hampshire. I'll give a shout out to them. Um, but it was the police portion of that case argued on the same day that the Salem and Portsmouth cases were argued at the Supreme Court. So there were common issues in, in those three cases. And again, uh, because the Supreme Court overruled Fenneman, it really shed the light uh, where it should be on the performance of public actors. Um, so each of the kids, students, uh, had a different area of inquiry, but they were really shut down across the board and it, it was just wrong and it's, it's now been remedied just recently. The city, uh, based on a court order, has released a 
stack of information to Professor Salcetti. Um, but to answer your question, whether it's the information is held electronically or not, if it's governmental public records, we have a right to know again, unless it falls under a particular exemption. What do you think, um, again, to Attorney Sullivan, you know, others who may be tuning in or, or following this from other communities in New Hampshire, um, what would you advise someone to take away from the outcome in, in the Keene case in terms of their, um, what they are entitled to as citizens of their communities? Yeah, you know what, what I would say is one of, one of the key most important factors is, number one, you submit your request in writing, but number two, you develop a rapport with the person on the other side of the counter. And, and they should, if they're doing their job properly, help you perhaps refine your request. And, you know, it's the same job as a newspaper reporter. You've got to develop uh, relationships um, and you've got to keep your uh, requests, number one in writing and number two, uh, targeted to the particular information you want. If it's, if it's overly broad, the city or the town or the state is going to have a, a negative reaction to that. So, you know, I'd focus on exactly what you want um, and develop a conversation. Uh, can I get that within five days? Is it going to take you more than that? You know, but, but you get more with the sugar than you do with salt. Um, attorney, no. right. I, I, sorry, go ahead. I said, you know, that as a report. I, I try, I try. <laughs> Um, Attorney Rice, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts, um, particularly on, um, you know, what, what Attorney Sullivan was just saying about that rapport between the requester and the, you know, the person on the other end. Um, but also with regard to, you know, um, I, I think you, um, there's sometimes a limitation or, or sometimes it takes that rapport between someone requesting information and the person on the other end of the line to, to develop an understanding of how it may be possible to share information that lives on a particular database that may be either proprietary or otherwise kind of specialized um, that would go beyond you know a spreadsheet or something of that nature. How do you try to facilitate those conversations within the city of Manchester um, for, you know, specialized technical information um, that may be difficult to provide in a standard format. Yeah. So thank you very much for that question. Um, <clears throat> so rapport is certainly beneficial, um, but it's not a prerequisite um, because the, the legal requirements apply, um, whether we're, we're having a, um, a pleasant interaction or, or a less pleasant interaction. Um, so I, I would say that first, first and foremost, um, having those conversations is helpful because it helps the, the government responder understand exactly what it is that you are looking for. Um, because um, oftentimes um, people, because they don't know how the records are kept, they may ask for you know, everything on a particular subject for a very wide uh, date range. Um, and I think that uh, broad requests for email would be one example of that. And, and uh, uh, municipalities are built to, to do the business of the people. That, that, is, that is why we are here and to do it as efficiently and at as low a cost as, as possible. That is, that, that's what we do to serve the public interest. So we don't, haven't necessarily built a system um, that is designed to be most efficient at producing copies of things, for example. So if you don't narrow your request, it means that the search is very big and will take a very long time. And you may not actually get what it is that you're looking for. Um, so I, I would say, uh, for example, if you are looking for something specific that it's really helpful to provide search terms, for example. Um, that anything that you can do to make the, the, the job of, of searching um, easier and more focused on what it is that you, that you actually want. Um, we do receive requests for um, data sets or you know, large quantities of um, anonymized uh, data or statistics. Um, I can't really answer that question generally because it really depends upon what the person is, is looking for. Um, but again, if you do your research and you have, so for example, if you've read that the city of Manchester has reported something out in a publication or on a website, 
and you're looking for backup for that, it's really good to, to share the website with the, the department that you're requesting the information from. Now, obviously, you know, things can get complicated when there are privacy statutes that, that apply. So for example, um, you know, HIPAA or FERPA, or um, there are many, many statutes that have privacy provisions in them. Um, and the intersection of those statutes with right to know law requests can make things uh, complicated. But we, we do try to, um, to understand the request. And sometimes that's really the, as Greg said, that's really the, that, that's, that's really the key. There's also a provision in the right to know law that, that I personally don't have any experience with and have never utilized, um, RSA 91A10, which has to do with requesting data sets, I believe, from the, from the state. And that may be something that you're more familiar with, uh, uh, Casey. There is no um, companion uh, statute that governs um, government entities um, other, than, other than the state of New Hampshire. Um, but uh, but knowing, knowing what you're looking for and making that clear, and as Greg said, having an interactive process with, you know, between the people requesting and the people that are, are looking for the information, I, I think that that's, the, that, that's the, the real, as he said, that's the key point. I, I want to mention a case I read about the other day, uh, happened in Massachusetts, the ACLU of Massachusetts requested records from the district attorney, which is like the county attorney here, um, requested a, quite a bit of records, no, no doubt about it. Uh, but they got their records and they got a bill from the district attorney for $1.2 million. Hmm. Um, so the ACLU has sued the district attorney over that, what the ACLU, and I believe, is a ridiculously exorbitant fee. Can I chime in? Fortunately, we don't bill for labor costs in New Hampshire. There was an effort maybe, oh gosh, maybe five years ago to change the law in New Hampshire to allow for the billing of labor costs. And, so, and fortunately it was, it was defeated. So we don't have that here in New Hampshire, but you can be charged for the actual cost of production, which is usually if it's a physical copy, tantamount to a, a percent per page, uh, you know, a copy, copy charge. It could be as high as 50 cents, which was just recently sustained by uh, the Supreme Court. So I just wanted to add that New Hampshire connection to that mass story. Um, just um, picking up on that kind of comparison on how New Hampshire does things versus how other states may do things. Um, Judge Delker, I, I'd be curious to hear from you. You know, New Hampshire um, is not among the states that has, for example, an ombudsman. Um, to kind of provide advice or guidance on um, right to know and related issues. Um, does the lack of that kind of an office or individual um, make your job harder, make you have to deal with, you know, I'm asking you to speculate here a little bit, maybe more right to know disputes than, than you may otherwise? Or do you have any thoughts on how that may affect your role as kind of the arbiter of, of these disputes? Yeah, you know, I mean, I. Um, so I'm not familiar with how the OMS, Ombudsman's office works in other states, but I imagine that having a person in that role could facilitate the conversation that we've been having here for the last few minutes between the person requesting the documents and the agency responding to help sort of bridge that gap of lack of understanding, whereas the court process is, is, is much more formalized. Um, you've got to make specific arguments and, you know, somebody's got to actually, you know, have um, an understanding of how to file a lawsuit. Greg, you know, mentioned the keen uh, state students and professors who filed the case there on their own. Um, and, and certainly I've seen that happen uh, many a time, but that's not the easiest way um, for a non-lawyer, that's not the easiest thing for a non-lawyer to do. And then when they come into court and make, you know, we've been talking a lot about a lot of concepts here about how you interpret 91A and what the different terms mean. And so for the lay person, you know, those, those arguments are not sort of the most obvious thing. And I imagine having an ombudsman um, be the arbiter or at least a go-between between the requester and the agency has got to facilitate that because the courts are, 
our job is not mediator. Our job is to decide the issues that are presented to us um, and not make arguments or advocate on behalf of someone. And so I, I think that having an office like that would very much change the fabric of how these issues were addressed. Um, turning a little bit back to what we were discussing at the at the outset of this conversation about the impact of COVID, um, I'd be curious, Attorney Bissonnette, as someone who's been in a number of public hearings and um, you know also court proceedings and other other settings um, over the course of the last year, what kind of changes do you think that this new reality that we're in has had on um, the public's ability to access, whether it's the state house, a city council? what have you, you know, how their local government is making policy and making decisions. Yeah, I, I've i really come to love it because I think it makes the process more accessible to everyday folks um, who don't have to travel from the North Country to Concord now to observe a proceeding and, and, and they can participate now from the comforts of their own home on some really important issues that they otherwise would never have been able to have their voice heard. So I, I really think it has made the process better. Um, uh, and, you know, I think the, the flip side of that is some of these hearings are, are longer probably because there's more testimony than folks are used to. I've noticed as a way to kind of address some of this, there have been three minute caps on a lot of hearings, which we didn't used to have in the old days or two minutes according to Greg for some years. In the old days of last year, we, we didn't have that. Um, so, you know, it, it does create a unique set of challenges obviously for the folks who are running these meetings. And, and, I, and I get that they're competing all of these different interests. You know, they don't want hearings necessarily to take 12 hours, but, Listen, I, anything that makes it easier for people to participate in the process, I support, and I, I think it is, I think it's been great um, on the hearings that I've testified. Because, you know, before, you know, a lot of times in some of these hearings, it would be the lobbyists like me, you know, the professional advocates and members of the press, and, and, and sometimes only one or two folks who are able to take time out of their day, miss work to testify. So I, I, I think on balance, I, I'm supportive of it. Hopefully it stays, we'll, we'll kind of see how that how that works going forward. And I think that, you know, from a court perspective as a lawyer, you know, I actually would much rather be, you know, physically in person, but I, I understand that, you know, that, that, that amid this pandemic, that's just not feasible. I'm looking forward to get back to court, but it's the same situation though, is that the public now can access court proceedings in a way that they never really were able to before, you know, unless, you know, it was televised on TV, which is so incredibly rare. Um, so, you know, it's uh, on balance a good thing. We're just going to have to see what, what we keep and what we don't after reflecting on this experience. So, if you don't mind, I, I want to chime in on that a little because I, I sort of have a mixed feelings about it because I agree wholeheartedly with Jill's observations about the benefits of making these proceedings more accessible. The one reservation I have is um, Appearing from your living room couch makes the whole process less formal. And particularly when you're in court, um, you know, there's a difference between someone pleading guilty to a crime. Uh, and I've had this happen where defendants are not driving physically, but they're the passenger in a car. And I've got to ask them, you know, are they, are they in the driver's seat or are they the passenger, you know, and, and versus standing up in court, you know, in, in those proceedings. Um, you know, there's something important about the formality of that and the seriousness of what's going on. Um, and I, th I imagine, and I've testified in the legislature as well, both as a judge and, and prior as a lawyer. And, you know, there's something about that process as well that's important. And, and you know, how those um, interests balance, I, I don't know, you know, in the end, we'll, we'll have to see how this all shakes out, but there is a huge cost savings. I mean, having sat in the legislature for hour upon hour on end, waiting your turn to testify is an enormous waste of time for the individual sitting there. I mean, it's interesting um, to watch, but, but as a lawyer or as somebody, you know, who's got a busy schedule as a judge, um, you know, it's not the most, um, best use of, of someone's time. And the same for litigants. You know, I, I think somebody mentioned this earlier, and maybe it was Emily at the beginning. Um, you know, having having lawyers and, and even um, defendants and defendants' families and, and victims and their families have to wait for hours on end for cases to be called. 
um, you know, that's not fair to them. And so the video testimony and video hearings is beneficial in that regard. So, you know, there's a trade off here and it's not all positive. I don't want to put all roses on it because I do think there are some drawbacks we need to think about. And, and the other drawback I want to um, call, and I've, I've read some studies on this, which is from a judge's perspective, not being able to see the person in the flesh has drawbacks to the ability to assess the credibility, who it is I'm dealing with. Are they making eye contact? Are they remorseful? Are they, you know, what is this person? Who is this person in front of me and how are they presenting? Um, that is much harder to do when it's by video th than it is when the person is standing or sitting there in front of you. And, and so I think we have to be careful about how far we want this to go because it, I think it does have a potential negative consequence on the outcome of cases. And the studies I've read is defendants tend to not get bail as frequently in video hearings because they're not physically present. You know, sentencing sentences can be longer because you're not the judge isn't physically present with the person being able to, to interact with them one-on-one. -on -one. And so, you know, so we need to be careful about uh, how far we go with this. Attorney Rice, feel free to. I, sure, I just wanted to, I just wanted to add that yes, there, and there certainly are um, a broad set of constitutional implications when it comes to um, court proceedings, particularly in the in the criminal arena that we have to sort out. And also um, Judge Delker alluded um, earlier to um, the rights of victims of crime. Um, and we've had a couple of situations in, in New Hampshire where um, those rights have been, uh, have been compromised to some extent. We need to obviously keep a watchful eye for that. So it, it certainly is a, a, a more mixed bag when it comes to court proceedings than it is, for example, with, um, with legislative hearings. I heard that in the trial of Derek Chauvin uh, charged with killing George Floyd, one member of George Floyd's family is allowed in the courtroom. And that to me is just not right. But COVID is what it is. You know, you got to take safeguards out. Jill will identify with this to some extent. I will never forget as long as I live arguing the EES case before the Supreme Court wearing a mask and my glasses of course were fogging up while I'm trying to look at the judges and I'm trying to look at my notes and, and Jill didn't have that, that drawback, but I will never forget wearing a mask arguing before the Supreme Court. I hope I never have to do that again. That picture made it on the front up every day. <laughs> it, the, the picture of us arguing that case in masks was on the front page of the union leader and I, I framed it in my office because I thought that was such a, a memorable event that we'll we'll forget once this all once we get beyond this, you know. <laughs> I'll never forget it. Um, I just want to I want to turn back to one other element of kind of the the COVID era. Um, and Attorney Rice alluded to this a little bit earlier um, when when she mentioned HIPAA as a consideration that sometimes agencies will cite as um, you know a, a reason to deny a request. Attorney Sullivan, I see you shaking your head, so I'm going to call on you there. Um, how often um, and and have you seen that used more frequently in the last year as a reason to deny the public? certain information and what's your read on the role that HIPAA should play in um, requests made to local or state government in New Hampshire? I, I've seen it used steadily for many years um, <clears throat> and often misused. Um, one thing that people need to understand about HIPAA is first of all it has to be protected health information and secondly the agency that has this information, believe it or not, needs to send their bills electronically. If they don't bill electronically, HIPAA does not apply. Now, there may be legitimate privacy interests at stake with respect to someone's medical records. But again, if it's not electronic billing, it's not HIPAA. And you can study that on the federal HHS website. I had to learn that. and. Uh, I sued a uh, fire department on behalf of my client 
They wanted to know the identity of an individual who had been taken away from a fire in an ambulance. And in court, I was able to ask the uh, fire department if they billed for that ambulance ride electronically. And the answer was no. HIPAA didn't apply. We got the name of the individual. So I, I think it's a misunderstood law that if people look at it carefully, it does have its place, obviously. And, and I also I've just said it, sometimes even when HIPAA doesn't apply, basic privacy law does apply. Um, Attorney Rice, without asking you to name any kind of specific examples, um, I'd be curious to hear, you know, when HIPAA um, may intersect with a request or, um, you know, when you found yourself having to kind of weigh that as a consideration um, when, when you're responding. Sure. Uh, well, the, the answer is not, not terribly often. And typically, um, you know, what we see are requests for information that has come into the possession of, um, you know, of the city, uh, for example, from a, from a third party. Uh, and so, um, you know, obviously we want to be very, very careful that we don't release HIPAA protected or confidential information, but it, it hasn't been a particularly um, uh, controversial um, issue here, at least since since I've been here. Um, and I want to thank all of our attendees. We've we've gotten a steady stream of questions here, and I want to allow enough time to make sure that we can get to as many of them as possible. So I think I'm going to turn um, turn to to those now. Um, I'll just go in order here, um, and I think this one may be um, best suited to to Judge Delker. So I'll start with you. But if anyone else wants to weigh in, please feel free. Um, David Taylor asks, um, the superior court rules limit remote access to the parties and the media. Should interested non-media citizens be allowed access and why or why not? Um, and feel free to weigh in with any additional context that you feel may be, may be beneficial there. Sure. Well, so um, that may be true about the court rules, but since um, the pandemic and since court the courts themselves have been physically, you know, the, the access has been physically limited to courts themselves. Um, my experience has been that anyone who wants to watch a court hearing can ask for the link to the hearing and they are emailed that link and can um, tune in. I've had many hearings with interested members of the public um, and, and they're not just media, they're sometimes just average people who are interested in watching hearing. Um, that I have and, and they tune in and can watch those. And so that's the way we've uh, attempted to provide access uh, to the general public for the cases that we're hearing during this time. Um, and now we have from Leah, um, she's wondering um, why aren't citizen initiatives allowed in New Hampshire? Um, how can we hold our government truly accountable without that ability? Um, Attorney Bissonette, I'm not sure if you have any thoughts on that, but I'll throw the floor open to anyone who feels um, interested in weighing in. I, I don't know the answer to that, but it, um, I, I'm, I, I, it sounds like Judge Delker might. It sounds Judge like Delker, go ahead. We don't have a history of them to be sure. Case on this point. Um, and the New Hampshire Supreme Court ruled, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 years ago now, um, that citizen initiatives are inconsistent with the New Hampshire Constitution. Um, so they're really, a, um, I teach state constitutional law, um, and uh, they're really a function of Western states, which, um, you know, came into the union later um, in sort of the populist era of the 19, you know, 1900s to the 1920s. Um, in which uh, the Western states really had this culture of allowing the people to participate directly in the democracy. And um, so that's why they're, they're, they're um, fairly common in California and, and the states out West, but less so in the East. And I think the New I haven't read that case in quite a while, so I, I'm not intimately familiar with the reasoning, but my memory of the New Hampshire Supreme Court case is, is basically the court said, you know, our constitution was set up as a representative democracy, not a direct democracy. And um, as a result of that, the way that citizens participate is by electing representatives, by using the right to petition for redress of grievances um, under the constitution through, you know, through their legislators and, and representatives. And it's in that way that citizens participate in, in um, at least at the state 
uh, level in democracy. Town, towns are much different. Towns are a direct democracy in, in, a, in a different system. But um, at the state level, you know, this is sort of not consistent with the overall structure of the state constitution. Next up, we have a question from Beth. Um, she wonders, and I'll put this to you first, Attorney Sullivan, um, what can we do about the lack of transparency from the city of Nashua? They are constantly throwing up roadblocks to records access. Um, and I guess just as a, as a general question, what can you do if you feel as a citizen that a city is, is throwing up roadblock after roadblock to access to particular records? Yeah, I haven't had any uh, recent requests for my services relative to the city of Nashua. Um, interestingly enough, uh, I think it was 25 years ago, uh, Union Leader versus the city of Nashua was what I, I believe was kind of a landmark case where Union Leader was seeking the video of an arrest. Um, the charges had been dropped against the individual uh, the police officer who made the arrest said that was a political bag job. I can prove it. I have a video of the field sobriety testing. The guy was legless. He was drunk. Uh, the case was over. The, the OD, DUI case was dropped. The fellow pled guilty to speeding. Um, so a union leader reporter went to the police station, asked for the videotape. They wouldn't release it. They said it was a matter of the privacy of the individual that they were protecting. And I said, wait a minute. This fellow was uh, videotaped out on a public street, uh, was arrested, uh, prosecuted. Um, what the heck kind of a privacy interest did he have? And that, that's Union Leader versus City of Nashua in 1996, where the court ruled if, if the information sought will shed light on the performance of a governmental actor or agency, uh, then the privacy interest takes a back seat. Um, when I tell that story to a group of police chiefs, I have to tell them that we got the videotape, played it uh, at Union Leader, and determined that the prosecutor had made the right call. That the fellow had clearly passed the field sobriety test. And when I when I say that, the law enforcement people feel better. And it and it, you know, the right to know sheds light not only on bad conduct but on good conduct. I always want to stress that as well. And, and with respect to the supervisors, how they're doing. Just to follow up, if I may, Casey, I'm sorry. I, I can't speak to, to Keene, I know, or to Nashua. I know it's been in the news, um, you know, recently. I, I think it does highlight that one of, I think, the problems in our system is when there is a dispute, you have to go to court. Um, and, you know, as Judge Delker kind of highlighted earlier, I mean, it's, a very formal process for litigants. It could be very time consuming and intimidating and expensive as well to hire a lawyer. So when there are disputes like this, this is why I think an ombudsman would be a really great resource to help kind of bridge the gap, you know, between a city and an and a, and a individual who may not have access to legal resources, which let's face it is most people, right? Most folks don't have access to the ACLU or Greg Sullivan or right to know New Hampshire or able to, to hire a private lawyer. So, you know, these issues can be complicated. There's a lot of gray and that's why I'm hopeful that this is something the legislature acts on um, because the ombudsman as well would be tasked with maybe identifying issues in cities and towns. If there are problems with their procedures and how they comply with 91A, that can maybe, you know, help address those issues. Again, I can't speak to Nashua, but that's really the idea behind that um, that person, if the legislature were to enact that bill. Um, uh, just moving on to um, our next question um, that we have from John. Um, and I think I'll start um, by posing this to attorney Rice, but if anyone else wants to weigh in, please feel free. Um, John's wondering, um, and we don't know what school board, um, can the panelists speak on how a school board could limit and censor the content of um, you know, the three minutes or the particular segment that's dedicated to individual public comment at the beginning of a school board meeting. Um, John says it's said at the beginning, you know, prior to public comment that no person shall speak critically of anyone connected to the school district. They are allowed to be, they are only allowed to be critical of policy. Um, 
I'm not sure, you know, Attorney Rice, how um, Manchester tries to handle public comment and how you try to balance um, those considerations that, that John alludes to. Um, I can't really, I can't answer or weigh in on the, um, on John's specific question um, because I can't, I can't give, um, I can't give John legal advice. But what I would say is that oftentimes um, the availability and length of a public comment period is governed either by a, um, you know, a, a municipal charter or um, rules adopted by the board. In New Hampshire, we have a long tradition um, of local autonomy and control. Um, and so um, if one wants to understand um, the rules for public comment, those would be the places where one would, where one would look. I can, Go ahead. I can chime in on that as well. I, um, I, think pub, I think public meetings are really hard, you know, frankly, because there are, you obviously have the free speech implications, the free speech concerns that we all care about, right? But you have some, some compelling and unusual governmental interests in the public meeting context that don't really apply, right, on like sidewalks or parks, right? You have a compelling governmental interest of wanting to have an orderly meeting, right? That doesn't last 24 hours where the subject of the discussion are those things that are, you know, on the agenda for consideration by the board. So there is more latitude, as a result of that, there is more latitude for municipalities to do things like a three minute rule, right? Which is a content neutral restriction. But there also may be some latitude for municipalities to have content-based restrictions. For example, like, you know, can you limit speech to only the issues that are on the agenda, which is a very common um, restriction that exists in the public meeting context. So, um, you know, so I am familiar with the provisions of, of municipal policies. I, I'm not sure about the Manchester one, but say, you know, you, you know, you can't engage in criticism. And I, I think if in a school board context, I mean, I think you should be allowed, you know, to engage in speech concerning, say, a superintendent, because the school board is the boss of their superintendent, and there's no alternative way to communicate that displeasure necessarily. But for other speech, there maybe are alternative forms of communication if you want to complain about the principal. It may be better to go through the superintendent rather than the board, because the superintendent reports to the principal. This, this is all to say it's complicated. Um, I don't have an easy answer for whether something is constitutional or not, but the, the, there are compelling governmental interests in, in the municipal board context for regulating an orderly, you know, meeting that's not disruptive, you know, that doesn't last forever, so. Just, just quickly, I want to say, as I think Jill just did, there has to be ample alternatives of communication in order for that kind of a content-based restriction to be reasonably imposed. So it should be easy, for example, for someone in this district to, you know, weigh in and make their, their critiques or their concerns heard to the superintendent or the school board through other means, it sounds like. Send an email, send a letter, mm -hmm. make an appointment, et cetera. Um, moving on to, to another question here from Rick. Um, Rick wonders, is the judicial branch exempt from RSA 91A requests? Um, and I, I will go first to Judge Delker on this, and then if anyone else wants to weigh in, feel free. Uh, so, so technically, the answer to that is yes, but um, the, that doesn't end the answer because the state constitution, part one, article eight, um, makes it very clear that all government officials are um, held accountable and transparency and access to government proceedings are essential. The Keene Sentinel case um, is sort of the, the premier case on this point where um, the uh, Keene Sentinel sought access to uh, certain court files and the court said under part one, article eight, the public was entitled to access to those court files, even though the 91A doesn't technically apply to the court. So, um, and, and there are other aspects. I mean, in, in addition to the actual physical files of the courts, um, you know, there is a right to public uh, hearing, you know, the, a, a right to a public trial. Um, and those that is not just designed to protect the defendant's rights, it's designed to protect the public's ability to see what's happening to make sure the process is fair. And so um, there are a number of constitutional rights that, that um, are implicated. 
I have to opt in on that one. Um, I, I lost a Fenneman case in 1993. I think the only other case I lost at the Supreme Court was union leader versus the superior court where union leader was seeking minutes of a meeting of the superior court judges. Apparently these judges go away, I think once a year, maybe in, if they used to meet at a hotel um, and they have discussion and vote on issues. And uh, the Supreme Court ruled in that case that we had the right to the types of files that Justice Delker just referenced, you know, civil and criminal cases subject to certain exemptions. But with respect to the administrative actions of the courts, you don't have that right. So I think I lost that case in 2002. So I'm going to try to bring it back again, uh, because I think that's just wrong. The legislature says to the Superior Court justices, you're all going to get $200,000 uh, to upgrade your video technology systems and certain justices decide that that money would be better spent on a, on a junket to Las Vegas for gambling. We don't have the right to know that right now. Um, so I hope to revisit that case someday. Uh, Greg, the, the judge school is actually in Reno, not Las Vegas. <laughs> the office of the governor technically as well is not subject to the right to know law and like certain aspects of the judicial branch it it's, it's it's kind of believed to be subsumed under instead part one article eight you know you can make a part one article eight request to the governor um but uh it is interesting to me how it's not technically part of chapter 91a that office like the judicial branch so I want to respond to Justice Delker because I happen to know there are casinos in Reno as well. That's fair. That's fair. And we do have one more question, but I just want to pick up on something that came up as part of that last discussion. Um, the um, balance between or, or the extent to which you rely on the Constitution versus 91A. Um, I, I'll throw this first to Judge Delker. How often do you find yourself, um, you know, considering the constitutional implications of a particular case versus, um, you know, the statutory, um, you know, text of, of 91A? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So, so a basic principle of judicial philosophy is to always deal with the statutory issue first, if that can address the concern and not um, address the meaning of the Constitution if it can be avoided um, because there's a statute that controls the question. And so um, I think that that was actually the outcome. I don't remember which of the trio of recent cases that the court said, you know, we don't need to get to part one, article eight, because we're addressing um, these issues under 91A. And so nine times out of 10, um, the issue is answered by 91A and, and the law there. Um, but you know, when it comes to issues, I haven't dealt with the governor's office, but when it comes to issues to access to court records, for example, you know, I have no choice. I mean, that the, the only option there is to um, deal with the constitutional rights of access. Your question is a debate that Greg Sullivan and I have in every case that we bring together is, how much to emphasize part one article eight so it's <laughs> does it depend on the office from from which you're requesting the records as as judge delker just said do you do you you know if you were filing a request against the governor's office for example would that one you know be framed based on the constitution the governor's office and the court records also uh, under the constitution but they really say the same thing 91a it's preamble and and part one article eight of the constitution basically say we the people have the right to our records because we are the government. What's, yeah. the, what's so kind of challenging about this is part one article eight bars unreasonable restrictions on the public's right of access. And so what exactly does that mean? And I don't think it's, I, I, I think it makes some practical sense to kind of look at chapter 91A, which is far more detailed and say that kind of defines the parameters of what's reasonable and what isn't. But to what extent though, is there a gap between those two things? And this, the New Hampshire Supreme Court hasn't really had an opportunity to kind of address, is there an exemption that's created under 91A that is just so unreasonable 
that it doesn't have a presumption of constitutionality. In fact, it is unconstitutional now under part one, article eight. That was actually an argument that Greg and I made in our cases last summer, which is if, if Fenneman is correct as a matter of how you interpret the statute, then it violates part one article because it's just un, it's just unreasonable to bar all of this information under the constitution from public disclosure. And the court, as Judge Docker said, said we don't need to address that issue because it's a matter of statutory interpretation. It's wrong. And, and one thing I want to um, chime in, you know, we're we're um, New Hampshire has a really robust constitution. The part one article eight is a provision that does not exist anywhere. Uh, anything like it in the federal constitution. Um, you know, a nibble around the edges on due process and first amendment, the Supreme Court has sort of nibbled around the edges on those issues when the US Supreme Court has dealt with this. But, um, you know, this provision, part one, article eight, the core of it, which is about accountability of government, dates back to the um, original constitution from 1784. Well, not the original, but the one that we've been operating under for the last 200 plus 240 years. Um, and, you know, it is really why um, this is such a foundational question uh, for New Hampshire. Yeah, and, and part one, the, the specific language of part one article eight was enacted even after uh, our chapter 91A. And so the, the, our, as a people, we thought it's so important that we thought, yeah, we have 91A, but we need to actually like put this in the constitution as well. I mean, that, that as Judge Zucker said, I mean, to me that highlights just how important we as Granite Staters value transparency as a society. I mean, we don't have, you're right, other states don't have that, which is, which is amazing. And, um, you know, why we keep emphasizing part one article eight in our cases to some extent. I, I want to chime in just a little bit because I know we're running out of time. I want to say that where we are today with respect to all these issues is so wonderful to see, particularly for somebody like me who's been doing this for over 40 years. Uh, I mean, we went through the cameras in the in the courtroom argument and, and ultimately prevailed thanks to attorney Chapman and, and Bassett in large part. Um, but but I've seen the Supreme Court and Superior Court justices just have a far more uh, enlightened, in my mind, approach uh, to all these issues. And it's, it's been wonderful to see. And, and I hope to continue to see our rights to access expand. Um, go ahead, Attorney Rice. You know, Casey, I just wanted to say that if, if people don't understand it already based on this conversation, I think it's fair to say that where the law is going is that per se exemptions, um, which are not, um, you know, clearly written in the statute, um, are going to are going to be um, narrowed uh, further and further um, as time goes on, and I think it'll be very interesting to see the effect of both the narrowing of those exemptions and the development of technology, which makes this information more easily uh, obtainable. Um, and I, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on to, to Attorney Bissonnette and, and Judge Delker for any final thoughts that you have. We did have one more question, but it was about remote public hearings, which I think we talked about um, at length earlier in the panel. Um, but um, uh, Attorney Bissonnette, any kind of final thoughts on where we are right now in the public's right to know or anything that the public you know, non-attorney, non-journalist can do to, you know, play their role in upholding this system? Yeah, I think for transparency advocates, you know, like myself and Greg, I think, you know, we feel like this has been a great year um, for, for transparency. We know a lot more today than we did a year ago with respect to so many things. So we're now getting access to you know, arbitrators reports and police disciplinary proceedings. So we can learn what, how, what's that process like for disciplining officers? Is it flawed? Is it working well? You know, we didn't know any of those things a year ago. And now we're starting to get, you know, a little bit of a flavor uh, of that. The same is true of, you know, as I said before, the, the you know, the, for example, the Concord School District report uh, investigating how the district, uh, you know, uh, examined um, sexual assault allegations. I mean, we just never would have gotten those things. And we are so better off as a society now that we have access to those. And, you know, we're still having, you know, some battles, you know, um, on those issues. We'll get more clarity as, you know, as the, the years come by. But I, I think we're in such a, a great place um, right now. And 
Um, we, to some extent, actually have former Chief Justice Bob Lynn to thank for it. He wrote a decision uh, five years ago that in which he kind of was opining a little bit how like maybe we got the law wrong here a little bit, but it's not before us, but maybe we, we made a mistake here. And that's really what, what Greg and I kind of latched on to is that maybe this is a potential strategy to, to open up these materials. And, and I, I can't believe to some extent it worked because, you know, I mean, sometimes you, you have these plans and they don't materialize and here it did. And I think we're so much better off. What we could see though, in addition, as courts are making this information more accessible, an effort at the legislature to unwind that, because you know you can the law can get changed at the state house across the street and undo all of this work. That um, and so we all, I think, for those of us who share my view at least, you need to be vigilant as to what's going on at the state house, you know, to make sure that we protect this win and that we continue to to advocate for you know a granted state that's more transparent, not less. Thank you all for being with us tonight. Um, thanks to all of our panelists and thanks to all of the attendees for joining us as well. I think um, there was a, a great uh, you know, mix of questions on a variety of topics and I appreciated everyone's interest in the conversation.